Do you want to hear a story about Charles Ponzi and how postage stamps led to a $20 million fraud? Will you give a few seconds of your time? Good evening, folks. Kennedy, we have died. The atomic power plant in the city of Kiev was damaged. How do you measure such an astonishing moment in history? The energy crisis who were gathered in South Africa. Do you want to hear my story? So I wanted to ask, how familiar with the Ponzi scheme or a Ponzi scheme are you exactly? I'll be honest, I'm familiar with the term Ponzi scheme. So whenever someone says, oh, I've got, I've heard this new way to make some cash or uh, a mate's put me onto this yada, 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 whatever, the first thing you say is, oh, sounds like a Ponzi scheme. So... The actual, I know who the bloke is because what, the owners of the New York Mets got tied up with him and lost some money to him. But the actual Ponzi scheme itself, don't know much details at all. So the owner of the Mets, was that with Charles Ponzi or was that with at a later date with Bernie Madoff? Uh, I think that was the Madoffs. Gotcha. The, the, Will Pon- the Will Ponds and yep. the Madoffs. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Because the yep. Ponzi, like, I, I actually don't think this is the original version obviously the namesake ponzi scheme has come from charles ponzi because i guess for lack of a better term he made it famous but i think prior to him there was a few other people doing it because it's not um it's not like it's a super well thought out scheme it's it's a pretty straightforward scheme i think you've just got to have the ball to try and pull it off yeah Plus, it starts, I mean, he was operating 100 years ago now. So he was born in 1882 in Italy. Um, And he didn't move to the States until I think around 1903. He was was 20, 21 when he moved to Boston, which is basically where the majority of his story takes place. Is that back when America was openly inviting immigrants to come and settle and make America Pretty much, because that was a big part. I mean... When I did the research mm. on, on him and his family in the early days, the family he was born into was fairly poor, which, you know, a lot of poor people grow up with the idea of wanting to be rich and make money and, you know, change, I guess, change the trajectory of their family. family. But um, the story goes that prior to, he, I think, his grandfather, that era was quite well off. Or maybe it was his great grandparents and his grandfather lost the family money and all of that type of gear. So he was always one of those guys trying to fit in with the rich people. And the little bit of information I could find when he was back in Italy was he was smart enough to go to university. But all the people that he hung out with were rich and guaranteed work, basically. So there was actually a little a little story where the everyone that he was hanging out with basically treated university as a as a holiday because they knew it didn't really matter they were gonna eventuate yeah. into banking jobs and you know inheriting their parents money and all that type of gear yeah so i think story kind of kicks off as he comes over to boston so he's 20 21 he comes over um and he later tells because he did a few interviews during his time but he later tells the New York Times when he landed in America, he had two dollars fifty in cash and a million dollars worth of hopes. <laughs> right. So that's the type of guy that he was. Apparently, he he came over yeah. with more money, but he lost it all on the on the trip over. Because I guess that's back in the day when it took you, you know, ten weeks to get anywhere. Yeah. So I did the little conversion. Two dollars fifty is roughly seventy five dollars today when he arrived in America. Yeah, jeez. But he was he was fairly resourceful. So the first thing he went off to do was go and try and learn English as quickly as he could because his goal was to, I guess, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Blend in. He didn't want people to look at him as a, 
as an immigrant or someone less than because he couldn't speak English. So his first, he first went off and he would take a bunch of, you know, rinky-dink jobs, dishwashing in a restaurant, all of that type of gear. And um, that was one of his jobs that he had in a restaurant he was fired from because he was stealing from the customers. <laughs> so the telltale signs were there pretty yeah, early. Yeah, and that's, that's the common thread, but like basically through his whole life, it's always a bit of a, a, bit of a graft, a bit of a scam. Mm-hmm. So he's been in the States for about three or four years and he's had all these odd jobs, dishwashing, waiting tables, cleaning, that type of gear, and he's getting nowhere. And I think it was about four years later, he moves to Montreal and he gets okay. a job in a bank and things are starting to fall into place for him. So at this point, he now speaks English, obviously Italian, and he's learnt French. And apparently, he had quite a charismatic personality. So that kind of helped in the the salesmanship of, of everything that he was doing. Yep. And it was the bank where he was first essentially introduced to the the idea of what would later become the Ponzi scheme. There was a guy that he was working for, his name was um, Banco Zarossi. That was the bank owner's name. And he was offering or promising 6% interest on all bank deposits, which was double the rate at the time. It's pretty good. So tons of money was coming in. Charles Ponzi eventually rose to bank manager and then it was kind of then when he found out that the bank was in serious trouble and <laughs> all these interest payments weren't actually being paid through profit. They were being paid through all this new money that was coming in through new accounts. Right. Which is essentially the Ponzi scheme. So the bank mm. eventually failed and the manager or the owner, he left, went to Mexico he took a ton of the money. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that kind of cemented the idea for Charles Ponzi that this is not the worst thing. He's 25 at this point and he's seeing money being made really, really easily. It's always interesting when you hear 6% interest and then now we hear that they didn't have any money coming in to pay the interest. They were essentially just taking the, the new people's money to pay the old people and then it was like you know, one big Ponzi scheme, as you said, mm. which says to me either that they were stupid and they didn't have a business plan or they all along had a plan to just rip people off. I think, and it's the case whenever you look at any of these Ponzi schemes, they always start out with the best intentions. Right. And then they start making bad decisions. And as more and more money becomes involved, those decisions become more and more amplified. Mm. which is the case for, I think, for all these schemes. They always start out with a good idea that can never really work, which is definitely the case for him that we'll get into shortly. Mm. So once the bank goes bust, he ends up staying in Canada and he actually lives at his bank, the bank owner's house, kind of helping out with the family, trying to earn you know, a few bucks and a place to live and something to eat. But he does decide, I want to get back to America. I want to get back to the States. I want to start over. I'm older. I'm smarter. I've got better ideas now. So he, visiting one of the old bank customers, no one's in the office. It's just luck by luck for him that he goes there looking for a job. Someone that he knew from the, from the bank. No one's there. Finds a checkbook. Writes himself a check. <laughs> <laughs> That'll work. Yep. So he, work. He, yeah. he knew the owner, and I, I assume he'd seen the owner's signature multiple times working through the bank. Mm. So he was able to forge his signature, and he wrote himself mm. a check for about four hundred and twenty bucks. Jesus. Which is a fair amount of money if you if you, back, do, yeah. if you do the math. Back then, yeah. Back for then, sure. yeah. Um, it was very very quickly that they worked out what had happened, and he was arrested. And he ended up spending three years in jail. So this is his first stint in jail. Mm. Once he's done his time, he gets out. He goes back to the US, and he gets he kind of, he gets involved in another scheme. Now it's smuggling 
illegal immigrants across the border. <laughs> God. <laughs> Which he's also caught doing, and he spends another yeah. two years in jail. So he's not off to a good start, because at this point he's about 30. He's in the States mm. finally, or mm. he's back in the States, I should, sta- I should say. And he's now back down into Boston. Continues looking around for work, trying to come up with something to do. Um, another scheme, an- no doubt. Another scheme, definitely. Yeah, because he doesn't want to do any actual work. He just wants to get rich and do it as quickly and easily as possible by the sounds of things. Pre- pretty much. Mm. I think if there was a way that he could actually do a real job and, and do that, he would do it because he, he seemed like that type of... He had that type of mindset, but he just kept getting drawn to mm. the illegal side of things. Sure. So he kept calling his name. Pretty much. Mm. He's back in Boston. He actually... This is where he meets his future wife. She's um, the daughter of a, a, a guy who owns a fruit stall that he would frequent, apparently, in Boston. And I couldn't find a ton of reasoning behind this, but he decided to leave out his criminal history. As you would? Yep. But for some reason, his mum wrote a letter from Italy to his future wife basically filling her in on everything before they got married or after before they got married and and she still married him anyway she still went on to marry him so her name was rose Hmm. and they stayed married for quite some time yeah right so they're they're married and over the next kind of few months because it all kind of now that we're out of jail again it all kind of happens fairly quickly for him so um he tries his hand in a bunch of other things um, trying to sell advertising space. He works at the grocery that his father-in-law now owns. He, he's off, like, like I said, always trying to find, like his goal was to always have his own office, lead to a business, to a company, to employees, that type of thing. He wanted to be a big businessman. He wanted to be a big businessman. That was, that was all he wanted. Mm. So it was, I think, 1919 at this point. So he first, remember, it's about 15 years after he's come to America. So he's, he's mid-30s now, and he finally sets up his first small office. And he literally spends the first few months just trying to come up with ideas. And he's constantly yeah. writing to people that he knows back in Europe, trying to sell them, I guess, on the idea of America and how great America is. And if I'm writing to you from America, my ideas have to be worth something. Hmm. And this was when he gets a response from someone. It's a company in Spain. And they're asking about one of his ideas, which was selling advertising space. They write to him asking for a copy of the newspaper or the magazine that they'd be advertising in. And they include in their letter to him a reply paid coupon for him to mail back to them so it's paid for right so you know now today we just write you know if you're writing to a certain company they've already set it up you can just write reply paid and send off your letter that's right yeah so it went from what he did to I think they used to put barcodes on certain special envelopes near yeah, now you just write the words reply paid yeah yeah so these coupons yeah. the way that they worked and the weakness that he found which would ultimately go into the, the business that he started was if I use Australia and as an example, if I buy a reply paid coupon here, say it costs me a dollar to send a coupon to, to to send mail from here to America, for example, you get the the letter in America, you get my reply paid coupon, you take that coupon to your post office and you give it to them. In return, they give you a stamp back to send back to me. But right. In America, say those stamps are worth two dollars. Yep, you're now a dollar better off. I'm or, in front, yeah. Or I'm a dollar better off because I spent the original dollar. Mm-hmm. So that was his first idea. He thought, if I can start buying a ton of these European reply paid coupons, I can sell them here in the states, and well, I can trade them in for stamps. I can sell the stamps in the states and make money. Makes that's makes somewhat sense 
Yeah, I mean, people still do it now. They buy, you know, you, you see it all the time. You buy something online, you rebox it, you sell it for a profit. That's basically what he was doing. Yeah, yeah, that's right. He was just importing postage stamps. At, n- at no point right now has he done anything illegal with the postage stamps. There was nothing around buying these reply paid coupons, bringing them or getting them into the States, trading them in for stamps, and then selling the stamps for the profit. Mm-hmm. So he's done nothing wrong. And that's kind of what I was saying before. In the very first instant of his idea, it didn't necessarily come from a place of breaking the law. It was only then when he started to collect investment because he started to basically pitch the idea to everybody, friends, family. He went to the bank, tried to get money. No one wanted to give him money. He's a convicted felon at this point. Yeah, he's got he's got a big rap sheet by this stage. But he only needed, I guess, a couple of people to say, all right, this might actually work. And like you just said, it makes sense. Mm. So now it's... It's 1920, literally the start of the year, January. And he rents out his his bigger office. And he starts his own company. It's called the Securities Exchange Company. Oh, yeah? In the first month, he convinces 18 people to invest in the company. $100 each. So he's collected $1,800. And that's about 50 grand today. Yep. The first thing he does is he pays them back straight away with interest in the next month and he does that obviously with his new investors money Mm -hmm. so now he's kind of got the ball rolling he's got that social proof that people know okay if we give him money we're going to get money back Mm. so he's got his big office he's got his investors and they really do start it just starts to come in because it's back then it's word of mouth it's a you know not a small town, it's Boston, but, you know, everyone's talking about it. I gave him 100 bucks. I got 200 bucks back. Get in there, have a crack. He starts hiring all these people. He's paying out commissions for every dollar board in. And it's literally just like two months. It's now between Feb and March. The total investment that he he's bought in in just that short period of time is $25,000. Yikes. Which, again, for context, you know, that's like over five hundred thousand dollars in in money today yep so he's got his guys working for him he's got his big office he goes out looking for new money he starts heading out to new new jersey new york and he keeps paying investors a crazy rate huge money because he keeps getting a ton of money in so if he was smart he could have maybe you know didn't have to go so crazy with that he probably you know there's your first maybe idea that he's not the best business person in the world 100 percent, and that's the problem i mean he's blinded by the money and i suppose Mm. he's at this particular point he's at this crossroad where he would literally have to say no to money and it was a a lot of money so by may now still in 1920 he's made roughly five hundred thousand dollars which is the equivalent to about five and a half million dollars today what a gun yeah so it's all happening super quick this has been running for literally five or six months at this point for him by july he's making a million dollars a week so let's just say let's just recap for a sec he's going to these investors saying i found a way to make money what i do is i get reply pay postage stamps from overseas and sell them here would you like to get in on this with me and basically people are going yeah that's essentially the the scam the scam at the moment yeah that was the basic pitch, but I think it had, it had moved on from that. Not that he had changed what he was doing, but people no longer needed to be pitched or sold on anything. They just knew, mm-hmm. if I give him money, I get money back. That, that was all that really it really was. It, there were so many people investing money with him and so many people getting money back that no one needed to be convinced. No one needed to be sold on the idea. So... So just for the people listening to, to who are catching up, he's essentially giving last week's money to next week's investors, and hopefully, yep. and hopefully next week, and then that cycle is going to continue in his mind forever, um, and that's that's the whole idea. That's the idea. So it's I convince yeah. you to invest. You invest with me today. Mm-hmm. 
next month I give you 50% return, you go, that's great. Mm -hmm. You don't realize Mm -hmm. that 50% has come from someone who invested with me next week. Mm -hmm. And that's the cycle. We continue down this path. You're always essentially a month behind. Yeah, because essentially it could be anything. You could you could take a any business proposal to someone and say, like, he could even change it. He could go to the first bloke and go, I'm importing X. He could go to the second bloke and go, I'm manufacturing Y. They don't give a fuck. They just know that if they give him money, they're going to get money back. Yeah, and that's all it was. No one needed mm. to be convinced on anything. No one needed to mm. be told anything. No one needed to be shown any type of proof. It was just mm-hmm. Joe Blow told me that he gave you a thousand dollars and then he was able to get two thousand dollars next week the next problem was no one was or not no one but a lot of these investors were leaving their money with him because the returns were too good if you're on a winning streak you leave it there you know they're you getting 50, you don't just cash out straight away they're getting 50 percent every month they've got no reason to say give me my money back yeah that's right so now it's it's literally June 1920, so it's six months since it's all started, and he's collected $2.5 million worth of money, which is the equivalent today of about $35 million. Oh, Jesus Christ. A lot of people had a lot of expendable income back then. I thought that was back in during the Depression times. Well, yeah, I mean, it goes on to talk about how a lot of people would, in, would mortgage their properties, their homes, and it was just... it was. So if you can picture this, he's got an office in, you know, the hustle and bustle of Boston. He would get to the office every single day and there would be literal lines of people going as far as you could see, waiting for him to get to his desk and start collecting money. (laughs) Jesus Christ. (laughs) So it wasn't so much that people were investing thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. It was the the, the problem was it was just everyone was investing money. Mm. and and you know everything's easy in retrospect and I'm sure he would have had to have had some type of thought at some point where he's like one day this is going to run out or maybe maybe people like th- maybe people that get themselves in this situation don't think like that I don't think they do somehow because it really was it got to the point it's the end of July he's earning close to a million dollars a day in 1920 <laughs> he could run for president. Yeah, so that's that's. Oh no, he could. Sorry, he couldn't. He was born in Italy. But that's that's the equivalent of about ten million dollars now. Yeah, that's Jeff Bezos' money. That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, hundred percent. So he he was he kind of he'd become the person he wanted to be, rich. Mm-hmm. You know, he had essentially everything he wanted. This is back when this is the turn of the century. Cars are only just a a brand new thing he had the best of the best car he had mansions he had bank accounts everywhere he had cash everywhere i mean it was it was noted that he had air conditioning and a heated pool in his house which apparently in the 1920s that was a huge like that's how you kind of knew that you'd made it there are some people in the 2020s that don't have that he had it he had everything yeah you know he was donating money to charities he bought into wine businesses he bought into macaroni factories and a lot of the reasons he was buying these other businesses was he was hoping to get to a point where he could actually start to generate some type of profit where he could pay these people back i was just about to ask that question in his mind that has to be the thought process i've got to start the sooner or later there might be one day where all my investors like you know you have to, if he's thinking along these lines they might want their money one day. So what am I going to do? So that's actually quite smart. Cause, and you know what? Had he had these businesses that he was buying into been successful, he may have gotten away with it. There, there is a chance because he was nev- it was never going to work with the postage stamps. No. Because it worked out that that initial investment that he got in the first month of operation where he collected that first $1,800, that would have been the equivalent of 53,000 reply paid coupons. Mm. The logistics alone wouldn't work. No. So Mm. over the the time that he was conducting his scheme, I think he had 
roughly 17,500 to 20,000 investors put money into his business. Yeah, Jesus. So for the first 10, that was 10 people that put that... Uh, sorry, that was 18 people that put the, the first investment in. That would have taken 53,000 postal coupons to mm-hmm. realize. Mm-hmm. Going forward, you got 20,000 people now. I think it worked out to yeah. be something ridiculous, like 160 million coupons would have had to have been available for him to, to realize those profits or to ever actually follow through with the scheme. All he had to do was wait 100 years and wait for the good old US Postal Service to, you know, be the, the beacon of of productivity and that it is today, and they could have helped him along the way. Yep. For yeah. context, though, they did say that there was roughly only about 30,000 actual coupons in circulation at the time of his scheme. <laughs> right. So it was never going to work. The, the theory no. behind it made sense. Yeah. But it was never, ever going to work. Yeah. Um, and it obviously didn't take long until someone started to realize this doesn't make sense. Yeah. And it was a, it was actually a reporter who first brought it to the world's attention that there was no way he could ever deliver the returns that he was actually promising in such a short period of time. Because, like I said, this has all only taken place over six or seven months at this point. That's right. So they released this report saying there's no way he could ever do this. And then he ended up suing that reporter in the paper for half a million dollars and won. <laughs> Unbelievable. So that, Unbelievable. That bought him a little bit of extra time because mm-hmm. no one wanted to touch it after that. He just won half a million dollars worth of damages because someone said that what he was doing wasn't, wasn't realistic. Hmm. But I think with anything, it continues along, especially once reporters are involved, they can't really help themselves. That was the Boston Post that finally kind of cracked it. The problem was, though, before it all went real pear-shaped, after he won that $500,000, there was other articles coming out saying what he's doing must be real. It must be working. Oh, no. Which resulted in even more and more and more investors. So all of this is taking place July, August of 1920. And that, that definitely helped him achieving the, the million dollar a day mark that he was up to. Yeah. And then I guess this is kind of like the beginning of the end for him, really. So it was July 26th for context was when that first article came out that he ended up suing them for and then over the course of I think it was only from research maybe six weeks they basically pulled the whole thing apart so they had financial experts get involved Um, they had people going to the like they had reporters going to the bank they had undercover people going in pretending to invest money all of that type of gear Um, and then To combat all of this, Charles Ponzi actually hired him uh, a publicist to try and, I guess, skew the optics and make him look better than he was. Yeah. His publicist, his name was William McMasters, he actually ended up turning on Ponzi when he realised just how, I guess, aggressively wrong what he was doing was. Mm. And he would later, I think, just this, this sums up what you said earlier... William McMasters was quoted calling Charles Ponzi a financial idiot who, yeah. who did not he did not seem to know how to do basic math <laughs> <laughs> oh dear um, so, <laughs> I, I don't know if this is when the phrase was coined probably not but it was definitely used a lot um, it was William McMasters who would basically be the downfall of Charles Ponsley, uh, Ponzi and, and he was the one kind of quoted for saying that he was basically robbing Peter to pay Paul. Yeah. So it's August August 2nd now, 1920. Again, this is only a month after he's kind of hit this million dollar a day milestone. Mm. McMaster's publishes his article saying that there's absolutely no way that Charles Ponzi is anything but insolvent at this point. 
he kind of estimated that he would have at least $2 million worth of debt. And I think once they put it through the wash, it actually worked out that he was about $4.5 million in the red at that point. And this was basically the, the beginning of the end for him. So it's now August 9th. Again, this all happens very quickly. Yeah. The bank gets involved and they start to examine exactly what's going on. They start to realize that there's actually not enough money in any of his accounts if the investors decided to cash out. They start to mm. move, they start to try and move some money around to basically group as much money together as possible because they are assuming that with all this negative press, there's going to be a ton of people trying to cash out of this account. A couple of days later. Yeah, that line that he used to see in the morning when he was going to work would probably be doubled about people going, yeah, I'd like to get my money back, thanks. Exactly. Um, mm. So it's a couple of days later, August 11th. It's now front page news. Oh, really? All his history is now available for everyone. So all the trouble he's been in in the past, his connection to the bank from back when he was in Canada and what his bank manager did, which was essentially a Ponzi scheme back then. Um, the bank frees his accounts, as you can imagine, um, and the account starts to dwindle as people start to try and cash out of their... You know, because they've got the opportunity to do this. They were the ones choosing to leave their money with him but they've got the opportunity to go ahead and cash out whenever they want. So he's arrested at this point with mail fraud because... Mail fraud? All of this would take place. You've got to remember, it's 1920. He would send, he would post out all of his reports to his investors. So you're, yep. you're an investor in Charles Ponzi's, you know, investment pool. Every month you get your statement saying, hey, you know, hello, you've received X amount of percentage in interest this month. So it was mail fraud. That's actually what he originally got charged with. It's like Al Capone going down for tax evasion. Pretty much. So um, he was released on bail. He paid that. It was $25,000 bail. He was then re-arrested basically straight away for larceny. Uh, larcen larceny. Larceny, excuse me. Um, again, another bail was placed for his um, through a bail bondsman because he had no immediate cash at that point. So $10,000. More articles come out. The bondsman pulls their pulls their bond, basically. So he's back in jail at this point. He's got. You've got to keep in mind. He's got two two things going on here. He's got state and he's got the federal charges. So at the federal level, he was charged with mail fraud. At the state level, he was charged with what was that word again? Larceny. Larceny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, or grand larceny, probably. Yeah. So, yeah. I think there's a point you have to know. It didn't just affect him, and it obviously didn't just affect the 20 odd thousand people that are invested in him, but the news of what he had done completely blindsided the banks, of which there was five banks that were kind of involved in business with Charles Ponzi, holding his money, that type of thing. Yeah. To which they basically went into ruin. So the total magnitude of the loss was around $20 million, which again, approximately today, that's about 190 to about $230 million. That's pretty big. Yep. So out of all of that, after everything was sold off, his investors were left with about 10 cents on the dollar from what they originally invested. <sighs> Jesus. Yep. Jesus. Um, two questions come to mind really quickly. Mm. In your research, what was the economic situation in America at the time in terms of how people were and, and all that kind of stuff? And secondly, uh, what, if any, regulatory changes came out of this Ponzi scheme? Well, I don't know that there was too many changes because, again, it's very hard to... to People are still doing it to this day. Yeah, right. And at the very end, I'm going to touch on what Bernie Madoff did because, mm. you know, he's the probably... He's probably more famous for doing it than Charles Ponzi ever was. Yeah, right. So it's an extremely difficult thing to prove, especially if you've got someone who knows what they're doing at the helm of all of this. And, and, it, sounds, and it sounds like in America, there's not a lot of regulatory about 
being able to start up a business. I just know from starting up a small little operation here in Australia, it's like you got to send this, you got to send that, you got to get this. Like it sounds like in America, you could just, you know, ring a few people around and go, "Hey, I run a business. Do you want to invest some money?" Well, this is a total side note, but I read an article once, very recently, and this was prior to nine eleven. But it was a, um, it was a professor at a university in Queensland here in Australia that was. He was um, writing a paper on shell companies and how people use, you know, these tax havens to dodge paying tax. And he said it was extremely easy for him to open up a a business in the States. He did it with an expired Queensland driver's license, <laughs> which ultimately led to him opening up bank accounts in America just as a part of his experiment. But... I don't know exactly what it's like right now, but I suppose prior to 9-11, which wasn't all that long ago in the context of this story, um, there wasn't much involved in opening up a company. And then money's still made of paper. Exactly. So after yeah. all, so he's, they've worked out everything that he's done. He's, he's lost everything. Everyone's lost everything. Banks have closed. People are 10 cents on the dollar. They've, they're ruined. He ends up mm. in jail. He's indicted. Um, at a federal level on mail fraud um, if found guilty it does he could face a life sentence so it's actually his wife who convinces him to plead guilty which results in a five year sentence five years yep. Jeez. of which he only serves about three and a half years right what scams did he run while he was in jail um it, there's not there's not a ton of information about what he got up to in jail. I think he just kind of did his time. Yeah, smart move. Yeah, he got out three and a half years later, and he's now still in Boston. Not really sure what to do. <laughs> there's, there's very little <laughs> that he can do. <laughs> yeah, he gets tried again though on the oh, no. on the state level crimes because yeah, he's, course, he's yeah. just he's just done his federal level crimes. Mm. Um without any money at his disposal he represents himself and he was able to get out of majority of the charges but he was found guilty again and he was he was then sentenced to another seven to nine years so even worse than the federal yeah well the, that yeah. totally separate so he's done his federal yeah. time he's now doing yeah. his state time they've got to make an example out of him yeah Th this is the one thing that's i guess really sad they made from multiple sources that i find that um, it was mentioned he was still receiving Christmas cards from a lot of his clients oh, while Jesus. he was in jail. God, they're idiots. Yep. So he gets out. Now, at this point, it's 1925, and he's released on bail. He gets out of Boston, obviously. He's got nothing, smart, nothing smart left move. there. <laughs> he, yeah, smart move. He ends up in um, Florida, and he launches his new his new scam scheme business, which is essentially um, offering very very small parcels of land to investors. Yep. Again, promising two hundred percent returns in sixty days. <laughs> so he hasn't. So he's not rehabilitated. He hasn't. He hasn't learnt. He's spent now, no. you know, close to what 10, 10 years in jail for his specific crimes, not including what he's done earlier. Yeah. Um, the best thing was some of these blocks of lands that he was selling were underwater Lit literal swamp land <laughs> great so again he's convicted and he's charged and he goes back to jail so he's learnt nothing as you said no uh, I think literally nothing literally nothing he tried to flee the states um, but I guess he couldn't help himself. He was telling... This is on a boat. He's on a ship again. He's kind of changed the way he looked. He shaved his head. He's grown a moustache, you know. And um, he couldn't help himself. He's got six weeks till he gets to Italy, I suppose, and he starts telling people what he's been up to. And it became evident at that point that he had never got his American citizenship. Yeah, right. So through the... The mix of everything, the fact that he was fleeing the States while he was out on, on bail, the American citizenship being an issue, he was then sentenced to another seven years in prison. 
<laughs> he's just a lovable loser at this at this point, isn't he? Basically. Mm. So now, after he does this last stint in jail, he's not an American citizen. It's 1934. As soon as he's released, he's to be deported back to Italy. Yep. He does go to, I suppose, who might have been one of his old mates, the governor of um, Massachusetts, to ask for a full pardon. That's quickly turned down. Yeah. Um, He was quoted saying, I went looking for trouble and I found it. (laughs) Yep. It's only now, in the 30s, late 30s, so it's 1937, his wife decides she wants nothing more to do with him. Ah, She's finally woken up. She divorces him. She wants to stay in Boston. He's asked to leave. He ends up in Brazil. And it's in Brazil where he ends up eventually passing away. Totally penniless, poor, just enough to survive type of thing. In um, mm. They called it a charity hospital in what I was able to... In the research I did, so I assume that's like a public hospital. Mm. But it was in 49 that he finally passed away from a heart attack. Um, and it was... He did one last interview through one of his... I guess surviving friends Um, and this is the last thing that he was reported saying even if they never got anything for it it was cheap at that price without malice a forethought I had given them the best show that was ever staged in their territory since the landing of the pilgrims it was easily (laughs) worth 15 million bucks to watch me put that thing over Jesus Christ (laughs) so he's definitely a character yeah yeah, he is. I can just picture him, you know, talking it up. Yeah. I think he's, he, he definitely seemed like the type of guy that he's probably told his story a thousand times to anyone that would listen. Mm. But on a much more serious note, and to end the episode, it was Bernie Madoff who, who like we said, has probably notoriously known and made famous the Ponzi scheme because what Charles Ponzi did is essentially nothing compared to what Madoff would go on to do. And I think the reason that Madoff was, it was such a mind-blowing thing that happened was because he was such a well-respected person in the the Wall Street, in the, in the, the New York, you know, market world. He was, I mean, he was part of the founding team of the, um, the NASDAQ. He was the chairman of the NASDAQ for a long time. And he would go on to... I'm not going to get into the full story, but he's... I don't know how long he would have lasted because he ended up confessing it to his sons, what yeah. what he'd done. People... He had been investi- investigated multiple times only because of the level at what the, that his company traded at. But with his connections and with his... Um, I guess his reputation, there was nothing ever found really damaging to him. He was always able to get by or get out of something or convince someone of something else. But he would confess it to his sons that it was, he was quoted for saying it was basically all just one big lie. There was no truth to anything that his company had done. Mm. And it was his sons that would then go on to alert the authorities, which would result in one of the biggest investiga- one of the biggest financial investigations. And one, I think it's still marked as the biggest financial crime in, in the American history. It was worth $64 billion in fraud, over 6,000 clients defrauded, and he's currently still serving, or well, he probably won't get out of jail, but he's serving a 150-year prison sentence at the moment. And now, folks, it's time to say thanks again for dropping in. We hope you'll make this a weekly visit. And hope we bring the final home. Hope you've enjoyed the evening as much as we've enjoyed having you here. Carefully, and come back again soon. Good night. Good night, now.